Prologis is the world's largest logistic real estate provider, with roughly 2.5% of the world's GDP flowing through its properties each year. When Chairman and CEO Hamid Mogadam founded the origins of the company in 1983, logistics was simply thought of by its workaday components, warehousing, inventory, and product transportation. Today, globalization and e-commerce have made logistics a household name. Logistics and industrial real estate, quite frankly, make the world go round. The industry is now potentially having another transformational moment. Urbanization, digitalization, and the pandemic have changed the way we live and shop. The pandemic put a spotlight on supply chain challenges and a move toward reshoring and nearshoring. And concerns over climate change are driving new conversations around green buildings and lowering the carbon footprint of retail. I sat down with Mr. Mogadam to talk about these issues as well as how he sees the future of logistics and industrial real estate. Hamid, thanks so much for doing this. Great to be here. So, Hamid, today the two-day package has really become part and parcel of shopping, but it wasn't that way when you first founded the company. When was your aha moment when you realized, hey, logistics is going to change structurally? You know, it's interesting. I think it was um, quite a bit um, into the formation of the company. We started the business in 1983 and went public in 1997. And at the time, we owned actually both retail and industrial properties. Uh, people don't, don't generally know that. A third of our portfolio um, were uh, neighborhood shopping centers, neighborhood and community shopping centers. And in 1999, I met a gentleman by the name of uh, Louis Borders, who was the founder of uh, a company called Webvan. He had previously founded uh, Borders Books and a number of other businesses and sold them successfully. And his vision was the internet grocer. Um, uh, you know, on steroids. And when I saw the first warehouse, I said, boy, the world is going to change. And uh, industrial business, uh, which was good business um, at that time, uh, could really become a great business. And that's when we decided to dispose of our retail portfolio and really double down on, on logistics and logistics in major um, areas of consumption, major population centers, as opposed to a less discriminate, less deliberate, um, you know, industrial strategy. So we not only got rid of the retail portfolio, but we also doubled down on the big markets in the U.S. and then eventually overseas. That's fascinating. Now, um, I know you have an engineering background like I do, uh, but what got you from engineering into real estate? You know, uh, I grew up in Iran in the uh, 70s and um, came here for college. And uh, what everybody did in those days, uh, Iran was growing 7 8% a year. It was like China today. And everybody came here to get an education, usually in engineering. You had to be a doctor or an engineer. And, uh, and then you went back to, um, to get involved in business. So engineering was really a prelude uh, to a business career. And I had always been interested in real estate because my dad was in construction and real estate. And I was exposed to development sites ever since I was a little kid running around with them. So, uh, so I really ne never thought about anything else. You know, looking beyond the real estate, um, t tell me about the traditional uh, landlord and customer relationship and why are you looking to change that? Well, uh, historically, there hasn't been much of a relationship between the landlord and the customer. In fact, they call the customers the tenant and the owner the landlord. It's a very feudal type of relationship and, and narrative. Um, and that works when you have two or three buildings, you're in one location, and there is no repeat business. E everything is a one-time relationship. But when you build a global company of our scale, all of a sudden you realize that it is not about the next deal anymore, but it's about how you leverage the entire platform for the benefit of the customers. So starting a number of years ago, we, we've really tried to change the culture of the company from a deal-driven organization to more of a customer-centric uh, type of business. You launched the Essentials business, I think, in you know, 2019, and it's really to drive an expanded uh, services and product profile that Prologis can offer its customers. What's the dream scenario for this business? Well, the dream scenario is like uh, the way every other business works. And the dream is to make life really easy for the customers. So 
uh, they, they have a relationship with you. And when they uh, agree to do business with you in a given location, they get the space, they get the internet connection, they get the racking system, they get the forklifts, they get all the things that they need uh, to run their business. We have a billion square feet. The average customer is about 100,000 feet. The average customer has two locations. Now many of them have hundreds of locations, but the average co customer has two locations. They're not going to be as efficient as we are in procuring and providing those services. So we can get higher quality service to them, make their lives easier, and deliver it at the same cost uh, or even cheaper and still create a margin for ourselves, which is very attractive. And, and our ability to provide that entire range of services to the customer uh, makes the relationship much stickier and leads to a lot more repeat business. Now, um, you, you also speak to some of the largest uh, players in you know, logistics, uh, I'm, I'm sure fairly frequently. You know, what, have, what are some of the issues they're focused on? I think labor is their biggest pain point. Uh, turnover is very high in this business. There is very little reliability in the supply of labor, et cetera. So as a result of that, we started our community workforce initiative where we're using um, a number of different tools online and, and in classroom uh, tools to basically educate uh, high school graduates for jobs in the logistics industry, all the way from hard skills, like how do you drive a forklift, et cetera, et cetera, to soft skills of how do you show up for an interview by helping these communities create jobs. We get all kinds of other benefits that we never counted on. When we started this initiative, we didn't even think about its impact on community relations. But it's a big difference when you go in for an entitlement on a new building. Um, so labor is a big issue. La the unavailability of labor is pushing companies towards a greater level of automation. Um, than they would have otherwise engaged in. People think people um, companies are going into automation because they want to eliminate labor. No, they're going out in automation because they can't find the labor. Aut automation is very expensive. It requires a big capital investment up front. A lot of our, uh, our uh, customers can't afford to make those investments. Automation also is not very flexible today. It's very custom made. So it can't um, be taken from one building to another building, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where we come in and we can help our customers with the automation aspect as well. And that's a big area of focus for Prologis Ventures. Now, um, one of the trends that I've been monitoring and uh, I'm sure you, you've been focused on as well is population migration. And specifically in a post COVID world, we've heard a lot about the urban to suburban shift. Uh, or we've heard about the continuation or an acceleration to the Sun Belt. What does this mean for where Prologis invests and could it mean the real estate product itself changes? The real estate product is changing all the time, but the migration from um, the urban core to the suburban areas of the same metro area, that has no effect on our business because essentially our locations are somewhat regional. Even the so-called last mile locations are really not last mile. Now, if we have significant um, major metro area to rural areas, uh, that could change our business. But frankly, it will change everybody's business. But I don't think that's what's going to happen. People are ultimately social animals, and cities are really important. And um, all the infrastructure that exists in major metro areas is, uh, is not going to go away. You know, what aspect of industrial real estate do you think investors most misunderstand? Uh, I think there, there are two parts of industrial that need to be understood better by investors. Um, one is the supply picture. And normally when the real estate market becomes really strong, people overdo it. Uh, you know, they, they overbuild and that chokes off the recovery and then the cycle repeats, it, repeats itself. I think it is less likely, it's not impossible, but it's less likely for that to happen now because a bunch of different things have changed. First of all, the structure of the industry has changed. Uh, you know, there are large players. We get in front of you guys every quarter and you scrutinize everything we do down to the last square foot and last market. This is not like 30 years ago where you had, you know, 30 different developers making independent decisions that all led to a lot of supply. So the industry structure is much more rationalized. 
the political environment, the entitlement environment is much, much tougher than before. People are, particularly in these major urban areas, they don't want to see uh, logistics developed in their neighborhoods because of the truck traffic and the congestion and all that. For all those reasons, and the fact that buildings are also getting bigger, you know, a, I, I hadn't seen a million square foot building uh, 15 years into my career. They just didn't exist. And today, there are million square foot buildings. We're probably building one a month. So a million square foot building is going to need two to two and a half million square feet of land. Just do the math on that. That's 60, 70, 80 acres of land, depending on the coverage. You're not going to find 60 acres of level ground in a major metro area. So there are natural um, constraints on supply that make today's uh, logistics world very different than yesterday's. Um, so that's one thing that's not understood very well. Uh, the other thing is the upside of logistics real estate in terms of conversion to other uses. We have over a hundred data center opportunities in our portfolio. That's the intersection of fiber accessibility and low power. Um, and those are just the, uh, the projects that have leases expiring in the next five years. Uh, so that's a huge upside embedded upside that we're going to harvest, and we are already harvesting uh, today. There is a life science opportunity there because we own more, more real estate in South San Francisco and have done so more than anybody else over time. And a lot of those things can be converted. Meanwhile, while we wait for those opportunities, we're getting good rent and good rental growth in the logistics uh, space. I have one more question for you, but I just wanted to clarify. So. Uh, as you alluded to earlier in our conversation, e-commerce, the growth was certainly very strong the last year during the pandemic. There's a sustainability to it. Are there new sectors that you think could see strong e-commerce penetration or growth, the ones we're not used to, but new ones that could come up in the next few years? Yeah, uh, so I think there are two technologies that we should keep our eye on in that regard. Uh, one is urban farming. Uh, so... Um, Food is a major issue, and food has a huge cost component, which is related to transportation, because the fields are far away from where the food is consumed. Well, now there are lots of companies, including some of our customers like Plenty, that have um, technologies that uh, allow them to grow food in urban areas very efficiently, low use of water, low environmental impact using LED lights and a lot of technology to recycle water and the things. And, and the produce is amazing. The other technology is a virtual reality and uh, augmented reality. I think that with respect to apparel shopping is gonna create a much higher uh, penetration of e-commerce into some categories that you really need to see, feel, and touch. And it's also going to, in a, in, a, uh, in a significant way, address the returns problem, which is a, a big problem with e-commerce. So through those technologies, which exist today, they need to, and some companies are beginning to apply them uh, to this business. I think that's going to become much more prevalent. And what that means is that some number of years from now, if we're still wearing suits, you can put one of these goggles on and there could be a custom made suit for you arriving two days later that's going to be as good as anything made, you know, in the fanciest stores, but it's going to be made for you. It, it, it leads to mass customization, which is a really, really important thing uh, for the growth of that category, because that category still, uh, at least on the higher end, has not seen penetration from e-commerce. Well, this was great to me, the fascinating conversation, especially on farming and virtual reality. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vikram. It's always good to talk to you.